All right, well, good afternoon and welcome to the second part of uh, the uh, workshop on the analytic foundations of uh, deep learning. I'm really delighted to introduce Soledad Villar. Uh, Soledad, it's, uh, she just started uh, two months ago as an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics at Johns Hopkins, and she's actually our first faculty hired in the Mathematical Institute for Data Science at Johns Hopkins. She received uh, her PhD in mathematics from the University of Texas, Austin in 2017. And later on, she had a research position at UC Berkeley and NYU, uh, where she was also a collaboration scientist for the Algorithms and Geometry Simons collaboration. Her research uh, is related to optimization, statistics, machine learning, and applied harmonic analysis. And she's also interested in data related problems from a geometric, topologic and algorithmic point of view. Um, she's really done uh, fantastic work in uh, theoretical foundations of clustering uh, and also beginning to work in fairness and gerrymandering in particular. And uh, today uh, she will be speaking about interpretable feature selection with some connections to fairness. Welcome Soledad, we're delighted to have you. Thank you, thank you so much for, for inviting me. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about interpretable feature selection, but before that, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the issues that uh, AI and data science have. Uh, maybe just a follow-up of what um, Guillermo was saying in, in his talk. And so let me start by showing you this slide. Uh, so. The, there's, there has been very negative impacts in society of some deployed systems that are based on data science and AI. I think that one of the most uh, clear examples is this ProPublica investigation in 2016, where they showed that algorithms that were being used to uh, decide whether someone that was incarcerated was likely to uh, commit a crime after release. Um, and they show that, that these systems were extremely biased against uh, black people. Uh, but there are other examples. For instance, this book, The Weapons of Math Destruction, shows um, many examples of how data science uh, has been used in, in society and producing harm uh, to some, some groups of people. There's also this, um, this, this book, Automating Inequality, uh, that shows how um, some, some services that were usually provided by humans, like social workers, uh, were re replaced by things that are being automatically uh, served by automatic systems based on AI, and that her, her, uh, ended up hurting uh, underserved groups like homeless people. And so there's, I think, as uh, researchers in this field, in data science and machine learning, we need to step back a little bit and think of how uh, what we are doing impacts society and just understand or like try to understand a little bit how uh, we can make make something that is a step on the right on the right direction and I, I saw recently a very nice uh, talk by Thomas Stromer, who is a mathematician at UC Davis, but his talk in this uh, uh, mind spiritual seminar was not about math. He talked about some fundamental issues of how data is being used by corporations in a way that is, can modify people's mood and be, uh, modify people's behavior. And he did an extensive research and showed a bunch of examples. And I think he, he based a lot of what he did in, in this book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And I think that is something that is, is important to, to look at because this, these things have been used to like influence elections, say. Like there are examples in 2016, this Cambridge Analytica, uh, uh, situation where like the, the it has been used to 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 modify the behavior and just like it's I don't know it's just important to 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 see these things but not everything is uh, malicious like things are not sometimes things go wrong without even 
even realizing that, that that's the case. And um, there's, for instance, uh, there's this issue with the, with privacy that that happens. Um, that you can you can be uh, you can think that you are anonymizing your data sets that you're publishing, but actually the that's not such the case. The classical example is from 1997, actually, where um, the a graduate student could use some um, insurance data that was released uh, by the insurance companies, and he and this and she could actually. Um, find the medical records of the Massachusetts government, government not by just looking at anonymized data. And after that, uh, laws were put in place to, to, to make medical data private. And this whole, there is a whole field of differential privacy that, that exists to analyze when, when data can be differentially private. And I think this was also relevant in in today's pandemic, I think that uh, I think contact tracing is is very important uh, to to make this place where our lives safer. But there's a lot of privacy issues with uh, with contact tracing, and 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 I think it would be important if we could release geographic information of where the, the positive. Uh, tests are where, where the outbreaks are without uh, violating patient privacy and without like taking into consideration the whole amount of impacts that that releasing such information will will have so yeah and, and contact tracing has been proven to be extremely successful like in for instance in my home country which is uruguay the they are doing a great job with that though in the last week the number of cases that are active cases doubled from like 200 to 400 and yes yeah, so i think that you open the country but also you need to like just take into consideration yeah so like just put these contact tracing systems in place anyway so comment uh so i uh i really uh related a mathematical problem that um, has to do with differential privacy uh, is the following. This is called the shuffle regression problem. So say that you have some linear, uh, linear model like the ones that we saw in Peter's talk earlier today. So your, your, um, your output y is a linear function of your input x and beta is your uh, linear coefficients that you don't know and you have some noise. The, your goal is to recover the, the linear coefficients from your data where you are given the x's and then a shuffle version of the y's uh, by an unknown permutation. And the question is whether you can recover the linear coefficients while hiding the underlying permutation. And that can be done for like a very specific uh, data models. And in particular, it's not obvious whether a system like this would be uh, differentially private. And there's some information, information theoretic thresholds for this problem and algorithms. Uh, so this is something that I've been working on. Another, another issue with, with data science and AI, and this is one of my final slides of my introduction before I go into a more technical talk, is the fairness. Uh, so we know that uh, data sets have biases and they, uh, these systems and these algorithms tend to reproduce and amplify existing biases, not just in, in data sets, but just I think that it's just society biases, like racial biases, gender biases, and socioeconomics status biases. And I think I want to point out, point out that uh, there's this group that this uh, is called the Mechanism uh, Design for Social Good, where uh, Ana Andrea Stoica is one of the members. And there's also this, this group called Trustworthy ML. And if you go to their website, they have a huge amount of uh, resources and literature about um, issues in trust, in like, well, accountable machine learning and trustworthy ML. They have, um, they have uh, 
a bunch of resources of how you, you can start reading about these issues like fairness and also causality, uh, privacy, um, interpretability, and yeah, and I use I I I use this to like enter the field myself. Uh, so I think this they have very very good collection of resources, and and also I wanted to mention that there is this brainstorm session on Friday where the spe speakers are going to be Andre Andres Toica and Salon Barocas, and the moderators are going to be Gita and Guillermo, and they they're going to talk about fairness and their way uh, they are experts on this. I, I am not, but I think this is very important. And I definitely uh, I, I definitely think that everyone should think about it. If you're doing research in this area, you should try to think about it. And um, so and I, I wanted to show you this picture. This picture is, I, I took it from a talk by Deborah Raji. And what, what she did was um, uh, with her group, they took some commercial facial recognition software and they evaluated the accuracy of the software among different classes. And they saw that for darker females, the, the accuracy was significantly lower than for the rest of the classes. And this was not the case like in Guillermo's talk where you could not improve in, in that class. Uh, they actually, after they wrote this paper where they exhibit for many classifiers in, in the were commercial classifiers, darker females were the ones that, that were the the, they had the worst accuracy. And after they published this paper, uh, these companies, um, they changed their, their systems and now they increase a lot the, 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 the accuracy of, of among the classes. So they actually could do it. They just maybe didn't think about it or like they weren't, I don't know. That was not a significant part of their test set and they, and then, yeah, and so just like pointing out these issues uh, by people in the research community made a change in how the systems are being deployed. So I think that's super important. Ah, so yeah. And another thing, so it was not my last slide. Another thing that I wanted to tell you is like, okay, not all data science that you want, that one does have necessarily negative impacts in society. I think that there's a lot of room to to do positive impact in society with data science and machine learning. And I wanted to show you this example by um, the group of Mattingly and Duke, where they uh, they actually use data science to prove that, that maps that ha are enacted, like um, redistrict maps that, so you have a state, you, you divide the state in congressional districts and each each district votes their own representative. And depending on how you draw the lines, uh, you can favor one political party uh, over others. And, and then and they show that the maps that were enacted in North Carolina were actually biased um, uh, by looking at uh, the distribution of all possible maps. Well, kind of like a proxy for the distribution of post all possible redistrictings and sampling with Markov chain Monte Carlo. And they actually use an argument like this in a Supreme Court case for racial gerrymandering in, in North Carolina. And as far as I know, the, the argument was actually accepted by the Supreme Court. And, and there's also, um, so, so sampling for this space is huge and Mar Markov chain Monte Carlo would not necessarily converge to a stationary distribution in the amount of time that they can run it. But there's this very nice work by the, a group in coming in Mellon by Peckden, where they show that it's possible to produce uh, results of like how, uh, of significance, of like how significant is this map and outlier uh, from sampling from, from micro chains before they mix by looking at local neighborhoods of the map. So that's, that's pretty amazing. And on something else that, that you can see is that some redistricting protocols can be seen as games and deep learning is usually very good at playing games. So maybe uh, deep learning can be used to design fair maps in the sense that the maps that are produced by, by this Monte Carlo, chain, Markov chain Monte Carlo, they are a distribution, but you wouldn't wanna use them because they have, like, they are not necessarily good. 
but if you just can enforce the constraints of what you want in this in these maps, can you search in this space and and produce fair maps using these these tools? Um, so my talk is going to be about interpretability and 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 this this has to do with like well if i'm going to make a decision about that affects people's lives like what Gita was talking the other day um that say job candidates you, you want to select the job candidate you want to select you want to decide whether a person is um uh would get a loan or not you want to decide whether a person would be eligible for bail uh, you want to you want to understand that you need to explain the system should be able to explain why it's making that decision. Otherwise, I believe that the decision making would not be fair. Like if you cannot explain why you're rejecting someone, uh, then I think that cannot be fair. And, and so this, so what are the features that your algorithm is using? And this is also related with some work that Solon has done i don't uh, i just it just reminded me uh from the guillermo sock that uh Solon has this work about uh proxy variables where like say that you train a system uh for say some deciding whether a person uh gets a loan or not and and this you cannot discriminate by race so maybe race is not a feature that you can use in your in your training set at all, like not in, yeah. So that's not even a part of your. It's a feature that you don't use in your, in your system. But there are other features that may be good to predict race. Uh, so those are called like proxy features, and they, like for instance, your zip code, like there's um, can be used to predict race, etc. So yeah, so they have some research in that. Maybe he will talk about it on Friday as well. Um, so. In my in my talk, I would have um, um, well, I, I'm just going to talk about um, how um, low complexity models are more interpretable. Uh, well, I'm I'm just going to have the assumption that that low complexity models are more interpretable. Like, and what is low complexity in this setting? Uh, it's just if you have a low rank structure or if you have a sparsity assumption, uh, then that would make it more interpretable. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna talk about how do you do a, like a low dimensionality like a dimensionality reduction that is consistent with your classification. This is uh, related with what Yi talked uh, the other day about like uh, compress compression to learn and learning to compress. Uh, so this is gonna use semi-definite programming. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, supervised genetic marker selection which is um, uh, identifying what are the genes that um, make uh, some classification structure hold, like in, in single cell RNA sequencing data. So it's, a, it's kind of, it can be seen as a particular case of this uh, label aware dimensionality reduction. And finally, I'm going to talk about unsupervised feature selection. So given a classifier, can you learn what are the features that are being used in your data set or what are, what are the most significant features of your data uh, uh, in, in the sense of, yeah, in a, in a particular sense. And for that, we're gonna use differentiable sampling and variational autoencoders. So I'm gonna start with this slide uh, where, okay, so um, 15 years ago, comprehensive showed that you can reconstruct exactly some, some signals from few measurements if the signals were sparse. And now let's look at the, uh, the classification problem. So say in comprehensive, you wanna reconstruct the signal, but in classification, say that you have cats and dogs and you want to decide, you wanna take a few measurements so that you can decide whether an image is a cat or a dog. So a priori classification is much simpler. So in, in the comprehensive setting, X is your signal and phi is your sensor matrix and phi X is your measurements. And so in order to do reconstruction, you need something that the number of measurements scales at least with the 
with the dimension of, of the manifold of your signals. But for classification, a priori, you just need something that is scaled with a number of classes. Uh, say cat versus dog is just like one bit of information. And maybe you don't, you don't care if your sensor sends a cat, uh, two cats, like cat one minus cat two to the null space of your sensor. Uh, you just need to separate the classes. Um, so this, this problem of um, dimensionality reduction for classification can be, um, can be seen as this um, compressive classification problem. And there's some work in this, in this field where they look at, well, how can you do compressive classification for low dimensional manifolds or Gaussians with low rank covariance or well-separated full dimensional ellipsoids. And, but uh, our approach is gonna be slightly different. What we are going to do, excuse me. Uh, we're, sorry. <laughs> What we are going to do is uh, we're going to look at this uh, projection factor recovery problem where we are uh, looking for an orthogonal projection of our data into a subspace. So we're going to project our data uh, so that the classification problem becomes easy. So X here is the data and Y are the labels. And we just want to find a way to project the, the data to a lower dimensional space so that the classification structure is preserved. So in, in this example, say that we have here these points in three dimensions. Uh, one thing that one could do is um, PCA, but, but PCA doesn't, it's unsupervised and doesn't really capture the, the, the different classes. So something that you could do that it would be a little smarter is just to do PCA on the difference between points in one class and points in the other class. And if you do that still, since you have like this large component that is kind of like orthogonal to the, yeah, to the, to the data, or like you have a lot of noise in this direction, you'd actually don't capture uh, the something that separates the classes. The other option that you can do is linear discriminant analysis, but also linear discriminant analysis fits Gaussians. And since this data set doesn't have that structure, then it won't be able. So the algorithm that we will propose is uh, we're gonna call it squeeze fit, that it would look at kind of like it looks, it will look at the data from all possible angles and then it will decide what angle makes the, the classes separated the most. So, and it could be like a way to interpret um, in what directions the classifier uh, or like the classes are, are more separated. So our approach is inspired in this large margin nearest neighbor for, for metric learning. And what we do is we say, okay, if given our data, so these are my x, uh, my x's with y plus one, so one class, and this is the other class, um, we, we look at this Z, that is a different set between points that have different labels. So they're from different classes. And then we were going to minimize the rank. So look for a projection to a low dimensional, the, possible, the lowest possible dimension. So that when you, when you project these differences from one set to the other, the difference, difference are projected to some vectors that have norm at least delta. So delta can be interpreted as a margin between these two data sets, but this margin doesn't need to be a linear separation between both data sets. Like in this case, there is this margin, but it's for pair pairs of points. So you don't actually need the sets to be linearly separable. There, okay, there are other things that you can do afterwards so that you don't have to consider all pairs, but, but basically that's the, the idea. And so you're looking for an orthogonal projection. Uh, so this op optimization problem is intractable, like op optimizing all this set of orthogonal permutations, uh, projections. So, so we are going to use an like a classical thing that is super relax to a convex set. And the set that we are going to consider is a set of positive semi-definite matrices. So we're gonna get a semi-definite programming relaxation of this problem. So, in the, in the setting that we had before, uh, 
this was our uh, optimization problem. You want to minimize the rank subject to this margin condition is preserved and pi is an orthogonal projection. And so an orthogonal projection has, uh, well, it's equal to its square and it has eigenvalues that are either zero or one, at least singular values that are zero or one. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to say this matrix M instead of having eigenvalues between uh, either zero or one, we're going to say that they have eigenvalues between zero and one. And that's one relaxation. So this M is going to represent, is going to relax the square of the projection. And the rank of um, pi is going to be relaxed to the, the rank. You can think of it as the L0 norm of the singular values vector. It's just how many singular values are non zero. And then we are going to replace this L0 norm by this L1 norm, which is the sum of the eigenvalues, so the singular values in this case, um, which is the trace. And uh, and then the constraints that the projection of these vectors have lengths greater or equal than delta gets translated on, as this quadratic form C transpose MZ is, great, is great, greater or equal than delta square for all C in this difference set. And with that, we get a semi-definite programming relaxation of this projection factor recovery problem. Um, and this, this is called squeeze fit. And basically, how do we use this for dimensionality reduction? So we, given our set uh, x, y, uh, we, we solve this semi-definite program. We take this m is the solution of this semi-definite program. We take the square root of this operator, and we get this phi. And this phi is going to be a proxy for our embedding, so we for our our projection. So we're going to train our classifier in phi x and y. So this is the dimensionality reduction. And why is this dimensionality reduction? Well, it's just like if the solution of this semi-definite program is low rank, which is promoted by using the trace of the operator here, then uh, then this will do dimensionality reduction. Um, and, and, yeah, and, and yeah, so um, we can actually prove some things about this semi-definite program. We can prove that um, if you plant a projection, say that you construct the data as I did in this example, where I had the concentric circles and I added noise in the, in the C direction, then our our labels are a function of this projected data to, to the X, Y plane. And that's our assumption. So we know that there exists a planted truth, like a planted projection. And our, our system, our semi-definite program will find this projection. If, uh, if we have some assumptions on how the data is behaved in this even this planted space x y, and that the the noise in the orthogonal comp, uh, complement uh, in the orthogonal complement is independent of the of the of the structure in the of the data in the in the x y. So what does that mean? So in particular, we can show some some theorems that says like if you have x y, uh, so that it's already projected, so you, you know that the, if you run squeeze it in A, it fixes the points. So it will be like, for instance, in the, this concentric circles. A is your concentric circles example. And if you add noise in a GIJ that is supported on the, it's like Gaussian noise, but it's supported in the orthogonal direction to the data. So you add noise in the orthogonal direction to the data. Then you know we have probability that if you have enough samples and your signal to noise ratio is large enough, then then you then your solution for for the data set A is equal than the solution then for the data set B. So basically adding the noise that doesn't affect your solution of the semi 
MIT program. And, um, and the notion of the signal to noise uh, in, in these data sets is like how well conditioned these two data sets are within each other. So you look at the, at the eigenvalues of these ZZ transpose vectors, which ZZ transpose, like these Z vectors are like the difference from one set to the other one. And you basically want them to be well conditioned, like you want to have, um, yeah, you want to you wanna have them to be well conditioned, like in, and in this case, they are not really well conditioned. They don't span the entire, well, they do span the entire plane, but they are barely the same. So, um, so the idea of the proof uses dual certificates and what you can do is okay you can uh you can have you can write um you can write the semi-definite program you can write the dual and they satisfy strong duality meaning that the that the solution of the optimal value for the primal is equal to the optimal value for the dual so then if you have a dual certificate for a that proves the optimality of the pi of the projection and you want to transform this dual certificate for A to a dual certificate for B, the, the data set with noise. And there, there are some uh, manipulations that you can do, but basically uh, in the end, you need to show that there's a feasible point and that it amounts to compute the statistical dimension of a cone in order to show that it intersects some plane. And in order to do that, we use this very nice paper by Joel Tropp where they show you how to compute the statistical dimension of cones. So basically it's just like a dual certificate proof. Um, yeah. So then the next thing that I wanted to tell you about is um, how to apply or well, how, how we apply these, these ideas of uh, dimensionality reduction that preserve the clustering structure. So, in this, in the previous, in the previous example, I I had a dimensionality reduction that could be on any on any direction. And here, I'm gonna use it for for selecting uh, mar genet selecting genetic markers. So it's, it would be a a particular a particular case of like this dimensionality reduction techniques. So. Um, let me uh, show you this data set first. So this data set uh, consists of uh, 36,000 genes, gene expressions, so for 8,000 blood cells. So the idea is that for, for each of the cells, where we have the count of how many times each of these 30,000 genes is expressed in the cell. And and so this looks like a very large, uh, super sparse matrix, and and then and then so what we do well what something that you can do to visualize a data set like this and people in in these communities do a lot is they use like some visualization technique that is a form of dimensionality reduction that doesn't preserve a lot of structure. It's just like some form of visualization that basically is called TSNE. And basically what it does is it, it fits a, a kernel uh, on pairs of points, like a Gaussian kernel between pairs of points in this large dimensional space. And then uh, it tries to find a map to a kernel in pairs of points in, in, R, in R2. Uh, for instance, uh, a, T, a T kernel, uh, well, a T distribution and and then they find this map from the high dimensional space to the lower dimensional space that minimizes the KL divergence using gradient descent. Uh, well, they, 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 they don't minimize it, but they just run an optimization problem there. And, and then this is the visualization that they obtain. Uh, so this, uh, something else that you can do is you can run clustering and you can identify classes. Uh, the, you wouldn't run the clustering here. You would probably run the clustering in the entire data set. And in this case, we have 14 different classes, 13 different classes. But these classes that we, that we have here are given by uh, the, 
the data set. They are, they are not, we didn't compute them. It's just part of the, say that is part of the ground truth of the data um, for different types of cells. Um, and so the question that, that you want to address is, uh, can you project this data to some genetic markers so that the clustering structure is preserved? So the genetic markers will be just like selection of, of genes in this, in this space. So it's a particular case where your projection is aligned with the axis. So the, the reason why they do this is because the, the procedure that, that sequences these, these, these cells um, actually destroys the cell. Uh, so they, and it's, you know, it's also very expensive. So they complement it with some imaging techniques that allows them to light up the cells that have high concentration of certain genes. And so you want to identify what, what the, and, and also allows you to have like location information of these, of these cells. So you wanna complement the, the sequencing information with the spatial information that you that you get for from this technology, and you want to know what are the the genes that you would light up in this in this scenario, and in this scenario you can only use some handful of genes, like twenty. Uh, so so basically this is why we wanted to look at like twenty markers, genetic markers of this data set, and we can write this problem as um, as, um, as a particular case of squeeze fit, where the projection that we are looking at uh, is, is diagonal. Missing one slide, I think. No, okay. So basically, if you look at, uh, in, the, in the squeeze fit problem, uh, we're, we were minimizing the trace of M, where M was a projection. And here, M is gonna be a matrix that has, is a diagonal matrix. And the diagonal matrix will have these alphas in the diagonal that corresponds to what, what genes you're picked. So if, if you have the identity, it's just like you're picking all these genes. But then if you have like a one here and a one here, that tells you what genes you're, you're picking. And, and then um, we can rewrite this problem to introduce this like, as, as, so basically this is just doing a lasso. This is like a basically minimizing the L1 norm of these selection vectors. Where, um, where you have these constraints that points for, from different classes become separated. And there are many ways to, to implement something of this form. For instance, you, can, uh, you, you, need, you probably need to allow some slack variables to allow for outliers and not have these hard constraints. And, and, um, and also, in, in, the, in this scenario, we know how many markers we want. So we will have an L1 penalization of, on the number of, of markers. And, um, and also, but also this can be written in, in many ways. We can, you can write it as say that you have your classes. You can write it as some constraints of the empirical centers of the classes that you want, to, you want them to be separated. Or uh, you can also fit some Gaussians on your classes, uh, on your different classes, and use that to, to generate the set of constraints. And basically, yeah, um, but it, that would assume that, that the classes are legally separable. And we have a people installable package that works with these data sets and do this marker selection problem in this context. And the, and you can set how many markers you want, and you can see how the performance, the accuracy improves with the number of, of markers. And uh, also we can extend into hierarchical clustering structures where you have, uh, you wanna reconstruct a hierarchical clustering from your, from your data and, and, and look for markers that are consistent with the hierarchical structure. And in this setting, you can find markers that are not necessarily correlated with one class, but with, uh, with, with many classes. And then for instance, this marker is correlated with all these classes. And then you can do combinations of markers that allow you to recover one specific class. 
Um, so this is for the uh, for the marker selection problem. And finally, I don't know if, if you have any questions or comments so far. But finally, I just wanted to talk about the unsupervised setting. So, so far I talked about um, how to do dimensionality reduction that preserves the clustering structure with uh, any sort of uh, projection, like relaxing the, the space of orthogonal projections. And then I looked at this specific problem of marker selection where the, the problem uh, was was more restrictive in the sense that you didn't want to have any projection, but you care about specific forms of projections that were equivalent to just selecting the genes, uh, but they were also in a supervised way. So you wanted to be consistent with the clustering structure that is given in your data. And the next thing that we're working on is um, finding these, uh, these important genetic markers without knowing the clustering structure a priori, or even without, or maybe the data is not even clusterable in, in, this, in this case, they don't come from different classes. So uh, can we look at what are the significant markers? So like what is the significant features of my data set? Um, and so this is, um, this is different from what Gita was showing uh, yesterday. Because in Gita's talk, she wanted to find the best features in a, the features that explain the reasoning of a classifier for each specific sample. And in our case, we just want to have where the significant markers for an entire data set. We want to find these genetic markers that we can use for um, all the points in our, in our training set, say. And then the way we do this is by using some ideas that are similar to, to this concrete autoencoder and gamble softmax tricks. Um, so, to, so basically what we do is we have XSR input signal and, and our signal is gonna go through a marker selection layer where some markers are gonna be selected. And then that is gonna be fed to a variational autoencoder. And the goal is that the output of the output signal is close to the input signal, right? So in order to, to, to do this marker selection layer, uh, the idea is to use uh, differentiable sampling. And so the, the way you write this is this, uh, this W is going to be some differential function of like some, some one, alpha one, one to alpha n that is related to with this gumball soft matrix. And then you, you can take derivatives with respect to that. And so you can write, you can train this with the stochastic gradient descent by using that structure. And, and the application that we're working on is to find the genetic markers for the, evolu the evolution of cells. So we, we look at cells development from snapshot data, and we look, in at, we look at the trajectories given uh, um, by changes in the gene expression. And we, we're looking for markers that are informative of, of these trajectories. Uh, so I think that, yeah, I think that I ended a little earlier, but this is all, uh, well, this is almost all what I wanted to say. So I think that I gave a very long introduction uh, about uh, AI and, and data science being able, being like powerful tools. And this is like the very cliche phrase, like <laughs> from like a Spider-Man movie, like with great power comes great responsibility. So I think that we need to look into uh, the problem of fairness and privacy and interpretability. and. I have some work in this in interpretability regime. Uh, well, in this inter interpretability problems with respect to the uh, genetic data, but I think that interpretability is important in, in all these uses. And yeah, and yeah, and then um, 
yeah, just check out the brainstorm session on Friday. I think it's going to be very interesting. And um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. This is my papers, and this is uh, yeah, my my funding. Thank you, Soledad, for really a, a very nice and inspiring talk. Uh, again, uh, if there are questions, please uh, put them on the chat, and I'll be happy to pass them along. Um, maybe I, uh, in the interim, I wanted to begin maybe with a question about the, the maybe the second part of your talk, uh, when you were talking about free speed. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you might be able to, to relate it a little bit to Yi's talk yesterday in the sense that um, you were talking about doing a single linear projection uh, that uh, to a certain extent maximizes the margin of the latent representation. And then Yi was saying how uh, contrastive learning was maybe a typical criteria that was being used and he was uh, using an information theoretic criteria that was somewhat designed for a union of subspaces. Uh, do you think there might be any relationships or that in various ways maybe the criteria that you have might be maybe limited to simpler data structures? Yeah, yeah. So basically projection or can you comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. So in in, in the yeast in yeast setting, um, he was yeah, he was looking at projections that were not necessarily linear. And in our in our setting, this is just this is just like a simple linear version of that we're looking at linear projections that that are consistent with the with the classing of the data so i think his setting is is way more general than that um yeah i don't uh i don't know exactly how they relate but uh, I, I if I understood correctly, it may have been the case that he um, didn't fully have complete theoretical results like like the ones you had mm. Uh, mm. or the nonlinear case. But uh, from a practical perspective, I guess uh, the same criteria that you had could also be used to train uh, a neural network using that as a loss function, maybe with some constraints to prevent degeneracy. Maybe uh, I don't. I wouldn't know how that would look like, but hmm. yeah. So like you're saying, okay. So in this in this setting, you can do like a selection of your of your markers where you compress uh, your signal using these markers, and then you understand which are the relevant markers of your data. So is it a, a similar way to do that for like a low rank structure? Can you do this low rank structure selection mm -hmm. inside a, um, inside a, a neural network? Is that your question? Uh, I think that would be very interesting. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. But I think that the same ideas that you use to generate this this feature. Yeah. So I, I think that that should be something that we can adapt because you can you can be differential uh, differential with respect to the eigenvectors of your or, or like yeah the eigen eigenvectors of your like low rank uh, projection. But then if you want to look at the eigenvalues, you probably will need to use some, some, some sampling of this form. I think that is something that could be adapted, yeah. Uh, so there is a question from the audience from Sam Buchanan. Uh, have you considered non-convex optimization approaches to solving the problem that motivated uh, squeeze fit SDP? uh for scalability purposes possibly mm -hmm. uh, or is there a reason why these approaches can't work here um so i don't know if any approach will not work we did a lot of we we tried a lot of non-convex uh versions of this and we didn't we didn't get it to work but something that you can do is you can relax this set of constraints a lot. Uh, so continue being convex, but instead of using all the constraints, you can just like pick one constraint at a time or like sell, uh, sell, sample from your set of constraints so that that would make it more scalable. 
and that seems to work quite well. And for our uh, real data experiments, we actually do that. We, we simplify a lot the set of constraints. Mm -hmm. So to, just to kind of follow up on that, when you say you tried a lot of non-convex approaches, this sort of mm -hmm. like, you know, Bure and Montiero style mm -hmm. activations yeah. that you tried mm -hmm. and those didn't work, you're saying? Yeah, because, I, I, well, you you still would need to reduce the set of constraints, right? The set of constraints is, is large. And the Burer Montero, so if you have these like non-negative assumptions, uh, like this inequality, the Burer Montero works really well when you have equality constraints but when you have inequality constraints, it makes it much less efficient in the way you implement it, I think. My huh? next question was gonna be exactly on the, on the slide that you have here. So I didn't fully understand uh, the approach that you use for, for selection. I mean, uh, at first I thought, well, one can do a Bernoulli random variable for each feature and it looks a little bit like dropout, but then you went into these alphas and the fact that it was differentiable. So, mm -hmm. so could you repeat it or explain in more detail how this is done? Yes, uh, so the idea is the following. You can uh, sample from, um, from a, a discrete set using something similar to this reparameterization trick where you write your uh, sampling as a differentiable function of some of, of some variables uh, alpha one to alpha n, and then you sample from from the set one n. And the way it works is by using this uh, Gamble softmax trick. Let me let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah. So basically, there there is an algorithm that. Uh, similar to the reparameterization trick that you use in variation autoencoders, that you can write your sampling from uh, this discrete set as a function with respect to this, alpha, so with respect to some, some input, then, then you have some input, like say alpha one to alpha n, and then you wanna have a sampling with some, some probability distribution that is pr uh, proportional to this alpha one to alpha n. And, and so, you can write a function that makes like a like a convex uh, set where where the the corners will show will show up um, well the corners of this set correspond to the indicators of those vectors and then you have this function that samples from each of these things with each of these probability and then you can take the derivative with respect to the the the, pro the probabilities that you want. And so that um, there's a nice blog post but by Francis Bach explaining how that works. And, and then that is, uh, is basically the, the trick that you use. So it depends on like some temperature. If the temperature is zero, then you have something that is not differentiable, but it's actually this probability distribution. And then if the temperature goes up, then you have something that may give you something that is not necessarily an indicator vector, like it's not like all zeros and, and a one, uh, but it's something that is very close to this indicator vector. And, and then, yeah, and, and that's, that's the way it's done, basically. Um, now, connecting to the, the question to Gita yesterday, which I think you're making a point there at the end of your slide, right? So I think I asked her uh, whether her notion of interpretability would allow one to select, say, pixels in an image uh, that are the most informative for making a decision mm -hmm. uh, that would be for the entire class as opposed to for a single image. So presumably here in your training that network to do feature selection uh, in, in the application you had, I think uh, you were trying to do reconstruction. So presumably one could do this on images as well and say take the MNIST data set uh, and train this pixel selection Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And then whether, does it matter whether it's trained for reconstruction versus classification and yes, in, so what, in, what, in what sense could the feature be interpretable, I think is what I'm trying to get at. Well, hmm. uh, so 
So in this case, well, there, there are many ways to do it. In this case, we're looking uh, at features that are in, like they're the same features for the entire data set. Uh, so you, you could have it and it will show you some pixels in the image that make sense to uh, understand. I mean, I don't have the, the results here, but they could give you the, the, the pixels that are, that are relevant. Uh, so in that sense, it is interpretable, but in general, you if you look at like projections uh, that separate the glasses, it may not be that interpretable. Well, if there are no more questions, let me just thank Soledad for a great presentation. Thank you. Um,